After a brief introduction, the committee co-chair and chair will provide a brief overview of the key points of the survey. Then we will open the floor to your questions. We ask that those of you in the room please step to a mic on either side of the room to ask your questions. Webcast listeners can submit questions via email to webcast at nas.edu. Please remember when asking a question to identify yourself by name and organization. And now I'd like to introduce Michael Maloney, Director of the Space Studies Board. Michael. Thank you, Lauren. And uh, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you here today to the launch of uh, the latest NRC Decadal Survey Report, uh, this time in uh, solar and space physics, or also called heliophysics. Uh, and this is the work of two years. Uh, it's, this is the result of two years of work by the solar and space physics community. Um, decadal surveys in space science are conducted under the auspices of the Space Studies Board here at the NRC. As Lauren mentioned, my name is Michael Maloney, and I have the pleasure of being the director of the SSB. And on my behalf and behalf of the chair of this board, Charlie Kennel, I want to thank you for joining us both here in person at the Keck Center, but also those of you who are joining us by video. Before we get started, I want to also acknowledge and thank uh, NASA and the National Science Foundation for supporting this decadal survey activity. Uh, that support was not only financial, but also um, the, the agencies and, and most importantly, individuals of the agency spent quite a bit of time making sure that our committee and steering, our steering committee and panels had all the information uh, that they required to, to do the work. And so we really appreciate that also. It wasn't just those two agencies, but also others such as NOAA also gave us vital support uh, and information. Um, decadal surveys are the main vehicle that the NRC uh, uses to channel strategic long-term consensus advice from the space science community, communities to the nation. Uh, we could not do that without the support, as I mentioned, not only of the federal agencies, but uh, just as importantly and, and very critically, without the support and involvement of the research community uh, that, that have formed the foundation of the expertise of the NRC and, in our case, of the Space Studies Board. We on the staff here at the NRC feel privileged every day and thankful that we get to uh, work with these normally already highly overcommitted and very busy people who give so much of their time uh, to these endeavors, and in particular uh, for this activity over the last two years. Uh, I'm pleased on this very public occasion to thank uh, all, of, all of our volunteers who engaged in this activity, and indeed your families, uh, for the efforts and the sac time sacrifices that you've made over the last two years to help us at the SSB and the NRC conduct this activity on your behalf. And so I'm honored to do, introduce two of the volunteers today uh, to you. That's Dan Baker and, and Thomas Zabukin, who, chair, who uh, acted as chair and vice chair for the steering committee. Uh, and as such, were the powerhouses uh, behind uh, what I think will you, you will agree when you've heard the results of their activities uh, is a very compelling uh, science agenda uh, for the decade ahead. Uh, Dan Baker is a member of the National Academy of Engineering. He's also the director of the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics at the University of Colorado at Boulder. He also holds appointments as a professor of astrophysical and planetary science and as a professor of physics. Dan is best known for his research in, in uh, space plasmas and energetic particle phenomena in planetary magne magnetospheres and in the Earth's vicinity. Dan has received way too many awards to list here today in the time that we have, but most recently he's been selected to give the American Geophysical Union Van Allen Lecture at the AGU meeting coming up in, in December in, in San Francisco, and so that's quite an honor. We look forward to that coming up. Thomas Abukin is Professor of Space Science and Engineering at the Department of Atmospheric, Oceanic, and Space Sciences at the University of Michigan, and he is also Associate Dean for Entrepreneurship at the College of Engineering there. Thomas's research interests include instruments that measure the composition of plasmas in the heliosphere, new particle, new particle detection technology suitable for future space science missions, theoretical concepts and experimental exploration methods of the interaction between the heliosphere and the local and the stellar medium. 
together. Uh, Thomas and Dan started off this survey with a teleconference. It's, I just looked up this morning, started on August 19, 2010. So in uh, some ways it feels, I'm sure, longer than a year and in some, or two years, and in some ways much shorter. Uh, but today, I think rather than being the close of activity, is really just the beginning of the pursuit of the science opportunities that Dan, Thomas, and the team and the community have identified as being compelling for the next decade. And so without any further ado, I hand over to, to, to Dan to take us through the re results of the report. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Michael, for the kind introduction. Um, my name is Dan Baker, as Michael said, from the University of Colorado. And uh, it's been my pleasure to, it seems like longer than two years that we've been involved in this, but uh, it's been a, a pleasure to work with the community on this. My colleague, Thomas Zerbuchen from the University of Michigan, uh, has been vice chair, and it has indeed been a special pleasure to work with Michael, with, uh, Michael and the team from the NRC and with Thomas as, uh, as a very able associate here. We're going to talk to you today about the decadal survey. We're going to talk to you, I think, about a program that will illustrate the um, immense accomplishments of our discipline over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, we're also going to talk about, I think, a program that is um, responsible and will um, continue to show that we are very good stewards of the resources received. The um, program um, is geared toward the decade of 2013 to 2022, and uh, we'll lay out the uh, program plan over that entire interval. The next slide uh, here will uh, give a little bit more information. And Thomas, would you like to just talk about the, the title and what, what we're planning to do? Sure, Dan. Uh, I'm Thomas Serpok, and again, I'm uh, uh, equally excited to uh, have worked with you on this and also be done uh, with that work. Uh, Phase and, one, uh, at least. Uh, at least, uh, at least uh, the creation of, these, uh, uh, of this exciting uh, report. Um, working through uh, uh, the data that we got from various agencies, and especially from the community, it was really clear to us that uh, our report is about solar and space physics as science for a technological society. We really have a feeling that the next decade is one that uh, really moves us from a, a, a decade that is focused on understanding the drivers of uh, space weather of our uh, solar and space physics, the one that's focused on the responses of that uh, decade, we believe, will be one of discovery and of one of new and innovative approaches and tools, things that we will develop that will really change the way we, in fact, uh, look at space weather and uh, make predictions and also uh, focus on heliophysics as a system. It's absolutely clear that uh, this system works together and therefore needs to be understood together. That will be one of the highlights of uh, uh, the next de decade, but one that in general will focus on societal impact, that will really take that research and create value for society overall. So the topics we're going to try to cover for you today, um, as briefly as we can, is the decadal survey process. We'll say a little bit about that process. We'll talk about the accomplishments of the past uh, decade. Uh, the recommended science program, of course, what you're waiting to hear about. And we're going to wrap up with what we think is a, uh, in a very important discussion about a revitalized National Space Weather Program. The background on this is uh, shown here. And uh, Thomas, would you like to just uh, review the objectives of the review itself? Well, the objectives were given and were negotiated with the participating uh, agencies uh, that we got the task uh, on, of course. And they are to provide an overview for the science, uh, a broad survey of the current state and knowledge in the field. Uh, to identify the most compelling science challenges and, of course, then identify the highest priority scientific targets for that uh, next decade uh, and put that together as part of an integrated research strategy. Those are the objectives that we addressed in this report. Okay, so the study was initiated, as uh, was mentioned, in 2010. Uh, it's truly national in scope. It's really intended to talk about NASA, NSF. NOAA, DOD, all the investments that are being made in solar and space physics in various ways. It was uh, strongly community um, engaged. There were some 300 white papers and ideas, new concepts, new missions that were presented. There were numerous town hall meetings around the nation, uh, workshops at professional and, and scientific meetings of various sorts. There were uh, 85 or so NRC 
appointed participants, and the steering committee itself had 18 uh, members. We were very cognizant of the need to fit within the available resources, and so we used in innovative ways, as we'll talk about several uh, places in this presentation, about um, how to assess costs and, and technical readiness. And we used extensively the Aerospace Corporation, which we, uh, worked under contract with the NRC. And uh, we are uh, immensely cognizant of the, fin uh, the uh, uh, budgetary constraints that presently exist. So we're going to talk now about some of the accomplishments of the past decade. I'm going to show you here a chart, a very nice chart that's been put together by NASA that shows what we call the Heliophysics System Observatory. I should emphasize that this is also meant to be inclusive of the many ground-based and uh, such facilities that the National Science Foundation, NOAA, and other parts of the uh, program really provide. But this is a beautiful uh, diagram that illustrates the sun, the magnetosphere, um, we might note that they're actually not as close together as illustrated here. Uh, but the, the number of uh, missions uh, that uh, are portrayed here in white and uh, some that are going to be launched very soon are giving us a remarkable view of this uh, connected Sun-Earth uh, system. And we're going to talk to you about just a few of these that have made major contributions already, and we're certainly going to talk about the things that are upcoming. So, Remember that this system observatory is giving us a very special and important view of the connected system. I'm going to turn it over now to Thomas to talk a little bit about the solar physics and the um, heliospheric aspects. So, Thomas? I believe this is uh, natural art. It, uh, it's in my office. I put it up also in various hallways. I've seen it in many other places. This is our sun, the new way we learn to look at our sun in its beauty at, uh, at multiple frequencies superimposed here, basically showing that the atmosphere of our sun is truly magnetically dominated and is one uh, of the dynamical forces that are really shaping our environment. And I want to take you on a, a visual journey uh, through many of the things we've learned. Uh, what we've learned, of course, is not just uh, from the surface of the sun, what we've learned uh, through the various uh, missions and also ground-based observatories is actually uh, about the center uh, of the sun where a lot of, the, of course, the energy is being crea created and generated through a set of fusion reactions. That energy, of course, propagates out uh, through the radiative zone in an astonishing long time of over 100,000 years, uh, a transport that we now uh, much better understand and that is constrained through a series of observations uh, that not only helped us learn about the sun, but also about uh, particle physics. And, uh, that uh, energy then, uh, uh, at a certain time, is transported in a very different uh, fashion uh, through a kind of convection type of process, just like your frying pan at home, uh, but uh, at a much higher temperature in a way that uh, the gases, the material there actually is charged and turns into a plasma and creates a set of motional fields that are at the largest scale, differential rotation and so forth, but also at the smallest scale, generating magnetic fields that uh, emerge in various ways distributed, but also in localized uh, centers such as sunspots, the active centers that really drive the space weather around us. We not only see it at the top, we now see it at the bottom. We see the sunspots coming before they pierce through the surface, and we see these amazing uh, spectacles of, of actually that uh, activity here through the lifting of a prominence, a rather cool set of materials that is raining down gravitationally bound uh, from the sun and is held up by collisions of plasmas. But what you see now is the magnetic structure. This very localized kind of emergence turns into a global kind of system that is uh, addressing, of course, is filling uh, the heliosphere with plasmas, not just uh, uh, near the sun, but really uh, whole, uh, creating the space environment of all planets and is doing so in a highly dynamic fashion that you see here through uh, uh, one of these amazing observations in which uh, the activities uh, centers are really evolving and in fact uh, uh, at a certain time uh, turn a lot of that magnetic energy into electromagnetic and kinetic energy in fact overwhelming some of these uh, cameras such that you saw these kind of almost flash-like structure across the field and uh, of course uh, recognizing and, and being observed not only uh, by these remote sensing missions but in fact by stereo for the first time in three dimensions really allowing us to connect in three dimensions the perturbations anywhere in the in the heliosphere to these uh, generating um, active regions and uh, the, the solar activity. We believe 
that this uh, uh, observatory, which is uh, uh, the Advanced Technology Solar Telescope, will add a lot of value to the, uh, our understanding to uh, the physics of uh, the uh, very processes to drive that space weather, and will do so at a resolution that is unprecedented down to uh, just tens of kilometers, which is really the, the actual resolution that we want to get to to observe uh, what's happening there physically. The heliospheric physics is, is of course, uh, dealing with the space around. And what I want to do is now go entirely in the other direction, where a lot of the highlights of the last decade occurred. In fact, we, with uh, two spacecraft that were launched when I was a toddler or a small kid, were basically uh, moving out and, and entering a new realm of science we have never seen. Those are the Voyager spacecraft that are active and sending down a few bits uh, uh, per second here and there, and basically really entering that boundary region of the heliosphere and teaching us new science, uh, new science about the interfaces of our stellar sphere with our uh, local inner, uh, inner stellar uh, environment, and in fact learn, teaching us science about uh, uh, processes that we observe elsewhere in many other places in the universe, and in fact teaching us about things that we may have assumed wrongly and about things that we're learning right now and learn to interpret not only this science, but the science elsewhere in astrophysical context. Uh, I want to just uh, add one more uh, tremendous highlight, uh, a mission that's in development right now that will uh, dive in, uh, I think of it as like a, a, a mission to hell and back, really a mission that will dive down <laughs> as close as we technologically are comfortable with on multiple occasions, go close to the sun, and observe uh, the, the very processes that shape that heliosphere, the processes that not only, of course, uh, relate to the heating of the corona, the particle acceleration that uh, is so important in space weather, but also uh, really shape the heliosphere as a whole. That is a hugely exciting um, uh, opportunity for us to learn more about this system and, and its origin, the sun. Hey, and thank you very much, Thomas. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit now, and only a little bit about the many things we've learned about uh, the Earth's magnetosphere and other planetary magnetospheres. And I want to start with a mission that's just been fantastic. It's a five-satellite uh, mission called Themis. This was launched uh, to study the interaction of the solar wind with the Earth's magnetosphere. Um, the five-satellite constellation has helped us to separate spatial from temporal effects, and it is really led to a profound new understanding. We often see these uh, nice uh, kind of cartoon diagrams that show a very laminar kind of structure for the Earth's plasma environment. But what we're really finding is that it's a much more dynamic and much more uh, structured, spatially structured, than we might have imagined. The bringing together of these observations together with very advanced models are really teaching us uh, a tremendous amount and are poising us for the next phase of uh, uh, the next decade of discovery associated with magnetosphere and its interaction with the Earth and its uh, close environment. I would be remiss if I didn't mention one of the key missions that's coming up now. It's uh, going to launch. The launch window opens on the 23rd of August. As an investigator on the radiation belt storm probes, we're extremely excited to have the chance to go back. Some 50 years ago, Van Allen and coworkers discovered, made the first great observations of the space age by realizing that there were belts of radiation around the Earth. The radiation belt storm probes finally are going to go back with all the modern instrumentation, all the capabilities to really study this uh, system and to understand this powerful accelerator that exists just a few thousand kilometers above our head. And so this is going to be a truly breakthrough uh, science again in Earth's neighborhood. I also want to mention the uh, ionospheric and atmospheric system, which uh, brings us closer to the voter sphere, as they say. The, um, the aronomy of ice in the mesosphere has been operating beautifully for some five years now, making measurements um, of and making remote uh, sensing kind of measurements of uh, noctilucent clouds, these very ghostly clouds that form at about 80 kilometers altitude, and in many ways are the most sensitive indicator we have of the changing um, atmosphere and the changing uh, climate. These uh, clouds have been mapped. The time uh, evolution of them has been mapped, and so AIM has been making uh, spectacular contributions there. But I would also uh, like to point you to the advanced modular 
incoherent scatter radars that the National Science Foundation has been in placing. These are giving us a spectacular view from the ground of what's happening in this interaction between the magnetosphere and the ionosphere. Again, we just have to say that this has been a most remarkable uh, decade of achievement and understanding, and uh, we can barely scratch the surface in many ways of the things we're talking about here. So we're now going to talk to you about the recommended program, as I say, probably what you've been waiting to um, hear about. And so, Thomas, would you like to take this? Everything uh, we recommended fit in four overarching goals. The first one uh, is really focused on the driver of uh, as, uh, the sun's activity, the determine the origins of the sun's activity and predict the variations of the, the space environment. Uh, the second one is that system uh, character that I talked about, determine the dynamics and coupling of the Earth's magnetosphere, ionosphere, and atmosphere, and their response to solar and terrestrial inputs. A really crucial uh, piece. The third one is one that very much uh, lends itself to the uh, science that I talked about uh, with Voyager. It determined the interaction of the sun with the solar system and the interstellar uh, medium, uh, very much uh, uh, exciting, up-to-date, and uh, uh, very much emphasized uh, topic here. And then discover and characterize the fundamental processes that occur both within the heliosphere and throughout the universe, a point I made repeatedly as well. What we learn here is applicable in so many other places. We want to emphasize that, that the strength of our community. That's why that fourth topic. For those who might have been following solar and space physics since Thomas was a toddler, um, these may look fairly familiar as uh, themes, but each of these is a much deeper um, dive into the kinds of uh, areas, the four categories of areas that Thomas has talked about. Um, the, uh, I will also ask uh, Thomas to just uh, maybe talk a little bit about the completion of the current program then. It is our uh, committee's uh, uh, recommendation, and uh, in fact the highest recommendation that we uh, uh, really uh, for all, uh, National Science Foundation and NASA assume continued uh, support in the near term for the key existing uh, programs. For NASA, that um, uh, results of, uh, re uh, relates to the RBSP mission that you already mentioned, the Magnetosphere Multiscale Mission, Solar Probe Plus, uh, Solar Orbiter, and also uh, uh, IRIS, an explorer that's currently uh, under uh, development, as well as other explorer selections. For the National Science Foundation, this recommendation very much relates to ATSD uh, that I already mentioned earlier. So uh, I just want to uh, put a, a further point on this, is that uh, we have a wonderful program in development, and we really believe completion of that program is a, a key step that uh, should absolutely be pursued. Uh, the, the DRIVE initiative is, uh, is one that I, we're very excited about. And uh, Thomas, you might start this, and I will continue the story of DRIVE, OK? We believe that uh, the DRIVE initiative is a really innovative part of the uh, proposed program. And it's a set of specific recommendations that has at the core uh, the belief that we are at the inflection point as a community, as we said. And, and at such an inflection point, what is critical is a retooling of the community that relates, of course, to educational type of aspects and uh, training type of aspects. But also, uh, it's critical to, at this point, to really focus on innovation, to kind of learn how to use these tools that we've uh, started playing with in a much more comprehensive fashion, and also uh, active, effectively exploit uh, the scientific uh, uh, results that we're getting. So drive, diversify, realize, integrate, venture, educate, will enable NASA and the National Foundation, as well as other agencies, to more effectively exploit their scientific assets because of that. So we needed an image of drive. Um, we wanted to, I wanted to use the Colorado car um, and um, advanced technology car. Thomas, of course, wanted to use the Michigan one. So we decided we couldn't agree between ourselves. So we show here the N car. Anyone get that? OK, mm -hmm. they don't. OK, drive. What is drive? Well, diversify. Diversify really means to use observing platforms, small satellites, mid-scale ground assets to, uh, to really complement the larger missions that we're going to tell you about. What does realize mean? Well, it really means to take advantage and to fully fund the mission operations data analysis, the ongoing uh, heliophysics system observatory that we talked about, both ground-based and space-based. To integrate um, really means to integrate different kinds of observing platforms. We can utilize platforms from different agencies. We can integrate the um, agency activities and uh, disciplines in 
much more innovative ways, and those are outlined well in our report, we believe. Venturing forward with science centers, um, these are dedicated new centers, modest investment of funds that can return tremendous benefits. And we've seen that um, we need more investment in modern instrumentation, modern technology development, and so this is a, a key component of the DRIVE initiative. And then finally, as Thomas said, educating the next generation of not only space researchers, but space engineers to empower, to inspire. Uh, we feel very strongly that our discipline does a great job of engaging students. We want to provide all the opportunities we can for them. I want to talk about uh, the DRIVE initiative and the recommendations related to that to the, for the National Science Foundation. Uh, the committee was uh, very excited about the CubeSat program that was launched uh, by the National uh, Science Foundation and in fact recommends that this initiative be enhanced. Uh, there's tremendous value that comes from that, both on the science side increasingly, but also from the point of view of education, and both were stressed here. Uh, we also, uh, on the diversify theme, uh, recommend uh, the creation of a mid-scale uh, line for ground-based projects. There's a number of projects, and in fact, you're just going to come back and talk about that, so I'm going to let it stand there, uh, that are really ready for investigation if the right tool is available, kind of a mid-scale type of uh, line is available to actually tackle the science. On the realized side, uh, the, the um, uh, committee was uh, very much um, uh, focusing on the importance of uh, providing sufficient funding for, the, for both operation and science for the uh, ATST. Uh, it's absolutely critical once we put this amazing telescope up there that, in fact, we exploit its power and learn the science that we can get through uh, great operation and uh, on great science. The integrate side, um, uh, the one piece that uh, committee was really impressed by is uh, how many of the uh, lab plasma type of astrophysics uh, tools have, have uh, made um, advances and basically feels that uh, an inter multidisciplinary program would be really timely to really take advantage of that and, and for us to learn more about uh, uh, also uh, planetary magnetospheres, uh, ionospheres, look at the sun as a star and really the outer heliosphere and really deeply include that into the research portfolio that uh, that uh, the National Science Foundation supports in this field. Um, the uh, venture thing, you already mentioned that. It's uh, the committee had a strong belief that there were many, uh, several uh, science uh, problems. Uh, they're actually mentioned in a report. I recommend you look at them. That we only can crack with a kind of a, a critical size type of team that really include a set of skills to, uh, uh, we can deploy together towards uh, addressing that uh, science, and it's these uh, critical mass science centers that are really designed uh, to do that and really move kind of uh, uh, the community forward in leaps um, uh, to, uh, towards that. And uh, finally, uh, the committee uh, was uh, really uh, excited about the faculty initiative that the, the uh, uh, National Science Foundation put in place as a, as a result of a recommendation at the last decade and recommends that this be continued and also focus on curriculum development and the visibility of uh, solar and space physics in the national uh, type of uh, inventory of science. Absolutely. Those are the uh, recommendations. Absolutely. And uh, the mid-scale line is something we uh, feel strongly about, as Thomas said, and uh, we know that there are a number of ideas that would fit naturally into this present gap that exists, and so having uh, instruments like the COSMO or the Frequency Agile solar radio telescope that could uh, fit within this gap and produce uh, tremendous results. I want to uh, point now to the next um, area of, uh, this is the next step in uh, the recommendations we're making. And I can't say uh, strongly enough how much of the committee and uh, we in particular feel the Explorer program has contributed. This goes back to the very earliest days of NASA. If you look at the array of missions here in the middle size explorer just from uh, roughly the 1990 period or so forward. This is both astrophysics and space physics missions, but this is a who's who of, uh, of science missions. The accomplishments have been truly phenomenal. And uh, just breakthrough science and nimble, adaptable, uh, really flexible, really allowing um, the community to be responsive on a range of scales from the mid-ex to the small explorer to the university class and mission of opportunity. This has just been a fabulous program, and we uh, endorse it strongly. So uh, Thomas, would you like to just comment on this chart? And I will, I'll take the next one. 
So it is our belief that an augmentation of the Explorer line uh, will allow uh, permissions in a restored MEDEX line to be deployed in an alteration with SMEX missions at a two to three year cadence and really bring it back to the level where the Explorer line is the powerful tool that it is designed to be to really bring the community forward through the innovation of uh, PI-led teams and through the cost control and uh, the tremendous uh, successful uh, management that comes from a really tightly knit science-focused team uh, such as uh, what the Explorer program um, uh, provides. There's also mission of opportunities that have uh, uh, provided tremendous bang for the buck, so to say, uh, uh, in which uh, certain rights can be shared with uh, uh, instruments that can do breakthrough observations that otherwise just would not happen. And that's another uh, kind of uh, tool that would uh, fall under this uh, enhancement. The Explorer line was, uh, was cut rather substantially back in the 2004-2005 time frame. And this has done tremendous damage, has not allowed these mid-X missions to, uh, to continue. And uh, we believe that an augmentation of $70 million a year would just uh, enable a tremendous range of science uh, along the lines that we've both discussed here. Now, the next uh, step is the solar terrestrial probe line. And Thomas, why don't you discuss this, and I will take it from there. We spend a lot of time on uh, looking at the relationship of uh, cost and, and uh, kind of how would they relate to certain management principles. And we believe that our community is the community that really uh, has been most successful in using PI-led uh, missions and use them to the best uh, of, of value for, for, for us and the community as a whole. We therefore believe that the, uh, we should restructure the solar terrestrial probe line in a moderate scale PI-led line uh, with a cost cap and very much the principles that uh, PI-led uh, missions have uh, with a cost cap that uh, 520 million uh, per mission in FY12 dollars and uh, including full life cycle cost. Very much taking advantage of the lessons that we learned and the tremendous success uh, both in science return, but also in cost control that these PI class uh, missions provide to the community. And working uh, together with the Aerospace Corporation, we were able to demonstrate quite clearly from the historical record that the PI-led missions, cost cap missions of the type we're talking about here, that have been utilized very effectively, for example, in planetary science with the uh, Discovery class missions or even the New Frontiers, that these are missions that do achieve the goals of cost containment and Efficient, uh, efficient, effective trade-off of all the different components that constitute missions. So this is a, a very key recommendation from our, our point of view that these community consensus missions can and should be run in a different managerial style. Let me speak to this, uh, the prioritized science targets that we have then. Uh, these are the three uh, uh, top priorities. I, again, we have to emphasize that we are not talking about point design of missions. We are talking about science targets. If there are more innovative and clever ways than we uh, came up with in the process of, uh, of commu uh, committee deliberations and working with aerospace, we're delighted to see it. But the areas that we think are crucial and, this, and the order in which they should be studied are the understanding of the outer heliosphere, its interaction with the interstellar medium. Um, as Thomas talked about, we're at a unique place in our um, discipline's history with voyagers out there to make in situ measurements, doing more remote sensing of this interface between um, our solar system and our, our heliosphere and the local interstellar medium is key. The second area is the uh, area of understanding the variability of the uh, lower, uh, of the middle and upper parts of the atmosphere, the ionosphere, and how those relate to the um, weather that's going on in the troposphere. So understanding this forcing from below um, through the uh, point, uh, the reference mission that we call dynamic. We'll talk about that. And then uh, thordly, to understand how the magnetosphere, ionosphere, thermosphere system is really coupled, how the plasmas change the fields, and how the fields uh, act back on the plasmas. And that's Medici. And so those are the uh, science targets that we recommend. Tom? Let me talk quickly about IMAP. Uh, we already mentioned that we have uh, an in situ probe out there, in fact, two of them, uh, the Voyager spacecraft that make these unprecedented measurements that really provide ground truth for a lot of uh, the measurements that we do from here. In addition to that, uh, the IPEX uh, Explorer um, has uh, proven a uh, set of measurement uh, technologies and experiments that, that is ready to bring to the next level and, in fact, help us image from our, uh, uh, near our home here uh, near Earth 
image uh, th that boundary region, the heliospheric boundary region, in a new and unprecedented fashion, uh, we believe that the kind of leaps of knowledge are very much comparable uh, to the leaps that were occurred, uh, that occurred uh, when uh, uh, something, uh, the technology that uh, uh, enabled Kobe was uh, replaced by the technology that replaced uh, uh, WMAP. We think that IMAP, uh, therefore, will provide uh, properties and composition of the interstellar medium, really understand the nature of the heliospheric boundaries and that they're time-dependent uh, properties, and also really focus on the nature of uh, particle acceleration in this region, and, uh, and do so from the point of view near Earth, and therefore provide a natural platform uh, to uh, uh, get measurements of the solar wind and uh, uh, interplanetary uh, magnetic field inputs onto the Earth. So this is really a dual use kind of a, a mission, or that it will be making both these measurements of a very global nature as well as the key kind of solar wind uh, inputs uh, for space weather purposes. The next mission, dynamic, dynamical atmosphere ionosphere coupling. Uh, as I noted before, uh, we've spent a long time, thought a lot about how forcing from the sun, from above, from the magnetosphere works, but to understand more about how um, weather uh, in the troposphere uh, operating upward um, leads to important changes in this uh, middle part of the atmosphere is also key. And so the dynamic mission would uh, uh, multiple spacecraft making measurements of this uh, key property. Let me also remark when we talk about multiple spacecraft, this is a theme that you'll see again and again and well into the future, I, we think, for our field. But having uh, multiple spacecraft to look remotely and to make in situ measurements concurrently of the coupled system is crucial. And this uh, just makes the point about Medici, that it looks at the plasma generating the fields, but also the fields acting back on the to modify the plasma. So we, uh, again, recognize that these missions can be accomplished in various ways. We have existence proofs and costs that are, are well within these bounds from our aerospace studies. Thomas? There's a Another line uh, uh, in uh, the budget, which is the uh, living with a star line, and we're, uh, we're really excited about the science that it provided and the science it, 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 it does, uh, both uh, from the point of view of missions it enables, but also the targeted research and technology programs that have really uh, provided unique uh, uh, results or unique information about uh, uh, that, that kind of societal uh, impact in many ways that, uh, that uh, solar and space physics has. Uh, the survey committee does not recommend the changes of, of the organization of LWS mission in a similar way as the ST probe mission, and uh, really uh, uh, leave this as a large mission uh, line that uh, really allows uh, NASA to tackle uh, missions at, at large size, uh, kind of beyond what uh, an average uh, PI in our community would be com uh, comfortable with, and in fact take advantage of the tremendous capability that's in our centers uh, to, uh, to in fact enable these missions. Right. And the, the mission that can get started in this next decade, um, these will occur at roughly six year, five to six year cadence. The Global Dynamics Constellation uh, really studies uh, you, by using six spacecraft arrayed around the Earth, making concurrent measurements, can really um, separate spatial from temporal effects, and really will have a very strong emphasis on the last leg of the connected Sun Earth system and the space weather associated with this system. So it's a very natural fit for the Living with Star line. Here we see um, a very busy chart just uh, showing the uh, record, again, from roughly 1990 onward of the kinds of missions, and it is a, a fabulous array of missions and accomplishments. But the, the decade that we see coming up now will have a mix of the large class missions as seen at the top, the medium class, the explorer, more missions of opportunity, instruments of opportunity rides, and we'll have uh, a um, sequence of accomplishments in the survey interval that we think is a good match for what has been historically accomplished by the discipline. So um, the summary of, uh, for NASA, and uh, perhaps Thomas, you'd like to speak to this one? Well, let me just repeat what we already said, and that is that uh, in priority order, we uh, feel that the completion, uh, the complete implementation of the missions that are currently selected and programs that are selected is, uh, is the highest priority. We then uh, recommend the initiation of that drive uh, uh, initiative, and then, of course, the execution of a robust and, in fact, enhanced uh, explorer program, and then uh, really the launch of the strategic missions in a, a redefined, reinvigorated SDP line and in the LWS line to accomplish the committee's highest uh, priority science objectives. Uh, you've heard, of course, that uh, 
the first notional uh, mission is that IMAP mission focused on the boundary region, and then uh, Dynamic and Medici focused uh, on uh, kind of ionospheric, atmospheric, and uh, magnetospheric objectives, respectively. And then uh, 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 the uh, GDC is the next larger class LWS mission, right. that multi uh, spacecraft uh, constellation. Right. So, does it all fit? Well, we think it does. Uh, this is the budgetary uh, breakdown uh, as we um, see notionally these uh, missions and uh, elements playing out. You see here in the different colors uh, commencing in 2013 and going to 2024. Uh, we can talk more about the budgetary details. We just want you to note that uh, completing the ongoing program during the first part of this decade um, fits within the envelope. The black line that you see here was, were the numbers that were essentially given to us out to a certain point by um, NASA leadership. And, uh, and then with uh, some modest growth after 2017, and we also have what we call the red dash line there, an enabling budget, which increases at another 1.5% per year. But within that envelope, then, we can carry out the Living with a Star program. We can carry out the Solar Terrestrial Probe program. We can uh, carry out the Explorer Augmentation Drive, all of these things for NASA. For the National Science Foundation, which is more uh, sort of proposal pressure driven, we also believe that the elements that we've outlined here are quite consistent with the budgetary guidance that, uh, that we expect to see over the next decadal period. So um, we uh, poke up a little bit above this with a, a sort of a, an optimally arrayed uh, Living with Star GDC uh, budget. But overall, we think this is a, a responsible and very executable kind of a program, a very actionable kind of a program. The decision rules then um, have, uh, are quite consistent with what Thomas talked about, that if for any reason the budgetary picture is not as rosy as we, uh, or at least as we see it presently uh, lined up, as that uh, the solar terrestrial probe and living with the star mission lines could be reduced or stretched out in uh, time, uh, that would uh, accomplish these goals with, uh, with uh, more limited resources. Um, if further reductions are needed still, we could uh, also imagine a more stretched out explorer uh, line. We certainly don't want to fall below the present cadence of explorers. And heaven forbid, if further reductions still are needed, then the drive augmentation could also be stretched out or delayed. But these are uh, in the eventuality of, of budgetary issues. And as we know, there have been many such things in recent times. We also, in the report, give augmentation plans, that is, if uh, as we hope, the budget pictures will improve over time, not uh, get worse, that we have ways where we can accelerate all of these elements. And so it's a very natural uh, way of accomplishing as much as possible under budgetary constraints. So now we want to talk last in the la a few remaining minutes here before we go to questions about uh, space weather and space uh, uh, climate and the augmentation and recommendations for, for that. Um, as uh, Thomas nicely stated at the beginning, our discipline has come a long way in the last decade in understanding um, the important role that the science that we study um, underpins things that are of immense importance to society. The space weather, space climate um, have um, infused a lot of the thinking we, uh, of course, need and we fully recommend in this report that we emphasize the basic research that underpins this. We have also thought a lot about how to make a more effective uh, national uh, operational space weather program. So we, our first recommendation, which we'll talk more about in a second, is rechartering the national space weather program. By this, we really mean that this should be rechartered at a higher, more prominent level uh, in the executive office of the president under the National Science and Technology Council. But there are so many things that are going on now that and uh, could go on now that really represent a, a multi-agency partnership. Space weather is inherently multi-agency. And to uh, have a uh, continued L1 measurements, the uh, first Lagrangian point uh, measurements of the solar wind, as Thomas talked about, IMAP can do that after the Discover mission, which is queued up now by NOAA, will launch. Uh, continuing to have coronagraph and magnetograph observations of the sun is absolutely crucial for uh, space weather forecasting. Evaluating new observations and platforms. There are many locations like the fifth Lagrangian point, which would be an ideal location for uh, other observatories. 
and NOAA should have a, a more vigorous and uh, active program of supporting uh, basic work, research of a sort that will uh, transition, allow more effective transition of research to operations, and to have a, a distinct program of, that supports this, uh, this space weather uh, research component over and above the basic research that's now ongoing. So those are key recommendations. We have to say that the National Research Council, the academies have uh, played an important role of, uh, of highlighting what the um, societal and economic impacts of space weather are. I'm particularly fond of one report that I was the chair of uh, the, uh, the study. Uh, what a surprise. <laughs> but this, this report uh, published in 2008, I think has had a quite a, a bit of impact on policymakers thinking about what are the issues and what are the risks that attend to society's uh, concerns. Um, so, so addressing space weather, going back to the more animated view of all of this, of course, as Thomas talked about at the beginning, the sun is the driver of this system. This last decade has really been a, a decade of immense uh, improved understanding of the sun as a driver of the uh, entire connected system. But addressing that, understanding better what's really going to hit the Earth, how it's going to interact with the Earth, how it might lead to effects in the power grid and other uh, aspects of uh, things we depend so much on. Understanding more about how this system really uh, works through the outer boundaries of the, of the Earth's uh, system and ultimately leads to uh, driving of large-scale currents, particle flows, enhancements of, of uh, currents in pipelines, in the um, large-scale power grid, and ultimately can lead to failures of this power grid, as was seen in the uh, Quebec case in 1989. And moreover, understanding um, what that right might mean for society. We need to have a, a global operations uh, capability to do that. Understanding also the effects on uh, radio communication, understanding the effects uh, that might w wipe out communication through the ionosphere, might knock out our ability to use uh, global positioning system and uh, to lose our navigation capabilities. These are all well-documented concerns, effects on precision agriculture, navigation at sea, and uh, ultimately uh, the uh, global constellation of satellites that uh, constitutes GPS and follow-on systems, uh, both uh, as a system but also individual spacecraft that can be affected uh, through spacecraft charging or degradation of solar panels. And of course, NASA has continuing concern about humans on board the International Space Station. So we have uh, many tools now, but we have to have, and these are scientific tools, but how do we convert all of these into a true operational capability, 24-7, really assuring that these kinds of observations are there in perpetuity? That's really the challenge before us in space weather. And so the uh, continuity, the plan for continuity of uh, space weather observations, um, I would really like to, uh, again, turn it over to Thomas to just sort of uh, wrap up this part of the story. Yeah, you've seen uh, the key bullets. I'm not going to uh, repeat um, uh, most of them. Uh, it's absolutely clear that there are opportunities for us to create a lot of the, that uh, steady and uh, predictable type of coverage uh, now by doing the right programs. And we believe that uh, uh, supporting Discover and also then IMAP are the steps in the right direction in a plan that, of course, reaches far beyond that. Uh, we're currently relaying, uh, relying on ACE, another amazing explorer that has uh, by far outlived its design life and is uh, still providing uh, observations and is continuing to do so uh, because of uh, the lifetime it has in its orbit there. Um, coronagraphs and solar magnetic fields are absolutely critical. Uh, the solar uh, magnetic fields are the ones that are used in these computations that uh, that, uh, in fact, provides global uh, predictions of uh, space weather. Without those, uh, this is uh, hard to make these uh, uh, predictions, in fact, using the technology that was developed. The chronographs, of course, are uh, very powerful tools that we did not know about uh, at that level before, uh, before SOHO. And, uh, and uh, the importance, of course, uh, for um, um, the, uh, the right measurements with the right platforms at, at various locations, as well as uh, the transitional tools that uh, really take what we learn in the realm of fundamental science and so forth and turn it over into a truly powerful 
factors that add uh, impact to society is what these recommendations are about. Absolutely. So let's just summarize. Uh, we think we presented to you the, in at least skeletal form, uh, recommendations uh, that uh, have been distilled from two years' work now. Uh, we've defined a, a decadal plan that we think uh, fits within the budgetary envelope as we understand it. It focuses on basic research. It also focuses on societal impact. I think it emp empowers the community. It really uh, shows how to take advantage of uh, unique constellation of missions we have uh, available today, as well as new programs that can be put in place that will further augment this. It builds on a, a community that I, we think has been has risen to uh, every challenge, uh, a community that's been good stewards of the resources given and can do so in ever more efficient and effective ways. We've defined some uh, management approaches that we think can help contain costs and, uh, and lead to an even more effective uh, program into the future. And we think that these uh, missions or these ideas for missions that we're presenting here have immense uh, promise for new discoveries in the uh, upcoming years. So with that, we'd just like to go back to, to where we uh, came into this. And uh, Thomas, if you'd like to just uh, make any concluding remarks, and then I'll take it from there, OK? Well, the most important remark is that uh, you can uh, download the uh, republication copy of the report, including its gory details on each one of these recommendations. We, of course, did not have time to go into. You can do download it from, uh, from the URL that is uh, uh, depicted here, I want to say, from my point of view. Uh, Going through this work, I've been uh, very excited uh, to be part of this community and uh, being part of a community that really has learned how to uh, uh, take uh, fundamental discoveries uh, just 50 years ago or so and turn it into uh, one of the uh, most vital and exciting uh, communities that uh, really has societal impact uh, beyond what we would have imagined uh, 50 years ago. Absolutely. I agree with you, Thomas. And with that... We'd like to say thank you to the audience here and out uh, in uh, TV land, wherever you may be. I'd like to thank our um, agency sponsors. I'd also like to uh, just say what a pleasure it's been to work with all of you. And uh, with that, I might just, um, let's see, do I turn it back to Lauren, or should I ask Barbara and, um, and then Rich Benke if you'd like to say a few words, if you would uh, wish to. OK, thank you very much. <coughs> See, Dan, Thomas, Michael, Art, and, and Abby, um, NASA is very pleased to receive this decadal report. Uh, we appreciate the science community's efforts in defining this set of, of what are very compelling scientific objectives for the future. Um, these programs really do have the potential uh, to make fundamental advances in our scientific knowledge of the space environment. And I'd also like to say that we really also appreciate the, um, the definition of new ways of working between the federal agencies and with international partners as well. So these are, these are exciting times ahead, and, and we're very grateful to be part of it. Um, I'd also like to just thank everyone who worked on this report. I know it was a lot of work over the past two years. Um, when our community stands together and speaks with one voice, uh, it truly makes for a compelling message. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. And uh, uh, we certainly agree that this community has done a marvelous job, and, and we hope we'll continue to do so. Uh, now, Rich Benke from the National Science Foundation. Well, thank you for this opportunity to say something because uh, it's really a, a remarkable set of uh, recommendations and, and a very comprehensive and forward-looking study. Uh, NSF is really proud of, of what you all have done, what, uh, what, the, what the entire community, we know that it's been hundreds of people who've been work on, working on this for years. and. Uh, in the academy, Art and Michael, you've done a great job in pulling this together. Dan and Thomas, you've, you've done wonders in pulling this together. I know that, and we really appreciate that. And uh, 
and we it's now kind of our turn. It, you pass the baton on to us. These are the recommendations, and and now we have to move the ball forward. And and we're looking forward to doing that. I, I you know, we'll be studying uh, your recommendations. Uh, from what I can see, you know, very quickly, I I, I really like all of them. I, I want to do them all. Okay, and that's uh, that's uh, that's how I view it. Uh, and uh, we'll see if we can do that. So again, we're grateful for what you've done. Uh, you know, it will be an, an era of discovery. It will be a time to focus on societal impact. I think between the, the uh, agencies, this is going to be a decade of, of working together with our agency partners more than we've ever done with both NASA and NOAA and others. And so I'm looking forward to those opportunities and challenges as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rich. And Lauren? Um, now I'd like to open the floor up to questions. Webcast participants, you can submit a question via email to webcast at nas.edu. And I'd just like to remind you, when you ask your questions, please give your name and affiliation. Thank you. Hi, yeah. Uh, Eric Hand with Nature. Uh, my question, uh, your number one priority, drive. I'm having a hard time understanding what it is. Uh, is it an instrumentation, instrumentation program? Is it a microsatellite program? Augmentation to research? It seems like it's all of the above. So if you can kind of give me something concrete to latch on to, you know, is there some 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 way in which this this new initiative coheres that that justified you you uh, drawing it out as as something separate that deserves a new initiative? Yeah, as you say, in many ways it is all of those things, but I guess if there's a unifying theme, it is that it will unify and it will prepare us for the what we think is the brighter future, the opportunities that come in the um, latter part of this uh, decade. Right now, we uh, realize that investment, strategic investment in these several areas, as you say, they're diverse seeming areas, but they're all building um, a better, stronger, more capable community that's going to be prepared to uh, do even better and more effective uh, research in subsequent time. It's also something that tries um, through an initiative to more clearly tie together the different agencies. That's one of the uh, aspects here is that uh, our field can only make progress, we think, if all of the different agencies are really moving forward effectively uh, together. And so, uh, having investment in science centers, having investment in um, in uh, programs that um, get us uh, working with NASA, NSF, um, NOAA, uh, DOD, uh, all of these things are, are key uh, steps that drive endeavors to put under an umbrella and make it more clear and more understandable why we have to make progress on the small end of the spectrum in order eventually to make progress on the big end of the spectrum. Thomas? Yeah, I, you should know we spent a lot of time on, uh, on this specific recommendation that turned out to be our highest. And, and the major uh, reason we spent so much time on it is because we understood as we analyzed uh, kind of the, the, uh, our community as a whole and the challenges that are in front of us towards this uh, societal impact function. And we, we basically analyzed and realized that there were a number of kind of cross-cutting themes that through modest in, in increases and, and kind of dedicated focus would really kind of bring the system, the community, uh, together uh, in a way that, uh, that uh, if we didn't do so, a lot of the other pieces really did not uh, kind of uh, uh, live up to its uh, full expected um, uh, uh, impact. And so, so uh, I echo what uh, Dan said in a sense that, uh, that it's a, a dedicated vehicle to, to do that, do this analysis of really investing in uh, the community and its innovative potential as we move forward. It's a modest investment now, Eric. It's, I mean, it's something that uh, I think is affordable now, but can pay great dividends into the future. I hope that helps you understand. If I can follow on to that uh, modest investment, yeah, I think it was 33 million as the recommendation. Uh, a question about that, that along with the 70 million for um, the augmentation to the Explore program, uh, where is that? coming from, uh, wh where are the associated cuts? It seemed, I can't tell if it's predominantly from the 
solar terrestrial probe uh, alteration or if it's coming from, from cuts to living with the star? I think we would call it a rebalancing, that we're, we're trying to live within the, well, not cutting, but really trying to look at where we think the present funds, and we're not asking for new funds now, we're basically living within the envelope, say for NASA, that's been established, but ways to take a little bit from other places to put in this more cohesive plan for drive, and then uh, as the uh, decade evolves, uh, that there uh, would be with the rollover on some of the other um, major flight programs and things that are in development, resources start to become available, a wedge which can be invested, for example, in Explorer, so. But it's fair to say that those augmentations will be coming from uh, 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 living with a star and solar terrestrial probe? Essentially elsewhere in the program, yes, that's correct. And um, to our knowledge, no one has offered any of us new money right now, and um, so we, um, we have to uh, be as creative budgetarily as we can, and we think we have been. Thanks. Um, I have a question from a webcast participant, Randy Shostak, who is a reporter with the American Geophysical Union. Um, this question has several parts to it. Would you say that compared with the 2003 predecessor report, the 2012 survey includes more emphasis on evaluating the technical maturity and the probable costs of candidate reference missions in order to avoid having outdated cost estimates and to provide federal agencies with an executable plan that fits within reasonable expectations for future budgets? So uh, why don't I uh, take that? And the answer is uh, yes. <laughs> is it? Uh, we have uh, gone of, uh, out of our way to, uh, to really learn about what each one of these uh, reference missions cost. I mean, we, we really addressed it in two ways. I want to repeat again. We actually, um, first of all, uh, created in, in most recommendations here, PI class missions. So in other words, we put in many ways to control uh, in the implementation into the hand of the PI to make the trades that are so difficult and certainly are difficult for a committee that uh, makes recommendations many, many years out. We also uh, did an independent cost estimate uh, uh, with using aerospace uh, um, a corporation independently from this committee and all the, the kind of uh, people that may want to see one or the other of these missions happen for uh, personal reasons, really truly an independent kind of reference costing uh, estimate that basically says, yes, this science uh, can be addressed with one existence proof that we have uh, costed here within uh, the cost uh, bracket that, in fact, we propose for this line. So because of these two tools, the answer, of course, to the question is absolutely yes, and, uh, and uh, we hope it's a, a very resilient uh, process that will uh, prove to be uh, exactly like this uh, during the next decade. Of course, only history will tell. I, I also want to say that uh, we have watched carefully as other decadal plans have unfolded, and that without cost containment and without careful attention to uh, cost control, um, we, we see that uh, plans immediately run into problems. And so, yes, uh, to, uh, to the question, absolutely, we've uh, been very cognizant of this, and we put much more emphasis on realistic cost estimation. Um, related to that, would you um, give any examples of um, why it may have been detrimental to not have included this focus or as much of this focus in the previous report? Well, I think that, uh, as Thomas says, time has indicated that uh, initial um, rough order of magnitude or back of the envelope kind of uh, cost estimations um, have not stood up to a close scrutiny. And so uh, I think the nation, the nation space program, has really come to a realization that you have to look at all of the aspects. You have to look at the historical record. You have to consider the maturity, cost uh, containment, management techniques, all of these things have to be folded in. And so we've tried to be much more attentive to that. Um, this simply wasn't the climate of uh, 10 years ago. Uh, it is now the climate, and uh, I think it's probably for the better. I might suggest uh, the midterm report that was uh, uh, developed by the National Academy that looked at some of these kind of what happened. And in many cases, you could uh, really pinpoint some of the issues uh, to, to uh, the, the, the kind of uh, scrutiny, of course, that we have uh, put, put in place here. So, so there's a lot of information out there. Great. Uh, next question. If I can ask another, Eric Kane again with Nature. Um, Solar Probe Plus, 
your major flagship happening about the midterm uh, of this decadal survey. Um, we know what happened in astrophysics when JWST significantly overran its projected costs and threw that decadal survey completely out of whack. Uh, you talked about outside cost estimates of, of future missions, but what about Solar Pro Plus? Did you did you interview the team? Did you have any uh, outside assessment of that mission as it's approaching its expensive implementation phase? And what what confidence or assurance do you have that that it it won't throw your uh, work out of whack? I will um, talk about your last question first. I mean the. Um, committee uh, did a really thorough job interviewing the team and with our some of our most uh, experienced and also critical experts uh, uh, with in a way that really uh, included all opinions and really not uh, some of the conflicts that uh, sometimes come in uh, from missions that are already there. Uh, the committee is very uh, excited to see uh, Solar Pro Plus go forward and in fact uh, is uh, believes that the costing as done by the team now is a costing that uh, is uh, uh, robust and basically uh, can uh, relate, can uh, result in a tremendously successful mission within uh, within the bracket uh, provided. Um, we uh, asked by NASA, though uh, the uh, committee overall also, and uh, by recommendations of this uh, um, uh, this subcommittee that specifically on Solar Pro, we have included decision rules that are designed to uh, put uh, brackets and, in fact, uh, clear um, uh, decision processes in place should something bad happen. And uh, these uh, decision processes are, are uh, uh, described in detail. We have not, uh, in this presentation, uh, discussed them in all detail. But uh, I just want to say that the decision processes, I think, are uh, deliberate to, uh, and uh, very considerate to basically uh, uh, provide the kind of uh, uh, nece nece uh, necessary cover uh, to make sure that nothing bad can happen and destroy, kind of offset the balance of the community, which is what we're most concerned about. What is the cost that you assume for Solar Pro Plus in this? The, in the uh, study, uh, we cite the um, one point one and a quarter billion dollar uh, price tag that that was provided to the subcommittee that looked at this, that reviewed it for um, evaluation purposes, and. That's that's the kind of uh, limit that uh, that we think here, and uh, it goes exactly to the point you raised that when large missions, when flagship missions get out of control, they can do uh, tremendous damage to the smaller um, end of the spectrum. Um, as I guess we talked about on occasion, it's dangerous to be a blade of grass when the elephants are dancing, and we certainly want to avoid that kind of problem in the rest of the program, and so. It's uh, precisely to the point you raised, Eric, that we want to assure that our largest missions don't do irreparable harm to our smaller elements. I believe Art Charo, study director, has another webcast question that requires a little bit of explanation. Yeah, this was a, a, a longer question, but I'll just boil it down. There's a question from, uh, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing the name, uh, Valbona Kunkel at uh, George Mason University. Basically notes that, um, a lot of the assets that are being relied on now to do the space weather forecasting prediction are using research spacecraft that have no obvious follow-ons and worrying about what happens after stereo, what's the plan after stereo. I think we've addressed this somewhat in the, in the slides, but it would be an opportunity to talk again about what is the plan for an operational capability in the space weather area. Well, we... Um as a shorthand way of addressing that, we spoke about rechartering the space weather program. What we, what we think is that if the nation wants a true operational space weather program, it shouldn't be built strictly on the back of uh, science missions, as the question uh, notes. And, uh, and so we believe that, yes, there are presently NOAA satellites that contribute greatly to space weather. There was a plan for Discover, uh, but, uh, but ultimately, we think that there needs to be a more thoroughgoing study at the highest levels of the administration as to what constitutes a proper and suitable operational space weather program, observational, modeling, theory, all the components, and that 
uh, we then, as a nation, need to make a commitment to that. That may be a fairly expensive proposition. Uh, defining that in this study would have been beyond the scope of what we had been asked to do. But we make provision in this. We, we share some of the committee's thinking. And we also uh, point in uh, the directions that we think are necessary to go from catch as catch can to, uh, to really a much more dedicated and much more thorough uh, definition of a truly end-to-end -end operational system. Any other questions? Any questions from our webcast listeners? Okay, well, I'd like to thank you all once again for joining us in person and via webcast. Um, the report and related materials are all available on www.nas.edu. Thank you very much.